In this video, we are going to look at the mathematics behind backpropagation in a convolutional neural network. The purpose of this video is to get a basic understanding of how backpropagation works in a convolutional neural network so that it becomes easier to implement in code from scratch. If you are using a typical AI framework such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, etc., you will not even have to bother with the backpropagation as it is already implemented. This video will exclude the bias term in order to make it easier to understand the backpropagation process. You should know the basics of how a forward propagation works in a convolutional neural network. If not, this video will give you a brief introduction. We start with the input layer and the kernel. The kernel is often referred to as the filter. During a regular forward propagation, we start off in the left corner of the input layer. We multiply the weights in the kernel with the corresponding values in the input layer. The output is Z1, and the formula can be seen below. This is the first step in the convolution. Then we slide the kernel two steps to the right and multiply the weights with the corresponding values. Notice that we use a stride of two. This simply means that we move the kernel two steps at a time. This outputs Z2, and this is the second step in the convolution. Since there are no more input values to the right, we move the kernel two steps down and all the way to the beginning, and repeat the multiplications. This is the third step in the convolution, and the output is Z3. We'll now move the kernel two steps to the right and repeat the multiplications. This is the fourth step in the convolution, and the output is Z4. After the convolution, we end up with an output matrix, which we can call layer 1. Now, we flatten out layer 1 and output a prediction, which we will denote as y hat. y hat can then be used to calculate the loss. Now, we'll not go into the depths of how to calculate the y hat or the loss in this video. We'll simply focus on the kernel and how we can update it. So, let's get started. In order to update the weights, we will use this formula. Here, the updated weights are denoted with an asterisk. The i simply means that for a given i value in the range from 1 to 9, the formula will change accordingly. So, for example, when i is equal to 8, the updated w8 can be calculated by subtracting the learning rate alpha multiplied with the partial derivative of the loss with respect to w8 from the original w8. Now that we understand the formula, let's look at the terms. Wi is just the kernel. The learning rate alpha is a constant we choose ourselves. The unknown in this formula is the partial derivative of the loss with respect to the weights. Since there are an equal amount of weights as there are partial derivatives, we can represent this term the same way we represent the kernel, in matrix form. So. The next step is to calculate the partial derivative of the loss with respect to the weights. Let's get an intuition for how we can set up this equation. To make everything easier to digest, let's look at it one term at a time. We'll start off with w1. A change in w1 will cause a change in all the z values. This is because w1 appears in all of the equations for the z's. The change in the z values will in turn cause y hat to change, which in turn will cause the loss to change. Armed with this knowledge, we can set up the equation for the partial derivative of the loss with respect to w1. Let's simplify things further and look at one z value at a time. We'll start off with c1. Our objective is to calculate the partial derivative of the loss with respect to w1. A derivative is basically a term to measure the rate of change. We know that a change in w1 will cause z1 to change. To measure the rate of change in z1 once w1 changes, we can calculate the partial derivative of z1 with respect to w1. A change in z1 will in turn cause y hat to change. To measure this rate of change, we'll take the partial derivative of y hat with respect to z1. The change in y hat will now cause a change in the loss. To figure out the rate of change in the loss when y hat changes, 
we can take the partial derivative of the loss with respect to y hat. The last term of this equation can be simplified to the partial derivative of the loss with respect to z1. We'll follow the same logic for z2. First, we take the partial derivative of z2 with respect to w1 to measure the rate of change in z2 when w1 changes. Then, we take the partial derivative of y hat with respect to z2 to measure the rate of change in y hat once z2 changes. Finally, we take the partial derivative of the loss with respect to y hat to measure the rate of change in the loss when y hat changes. We'll then simplify the last term as we did earlier. If we do the same thing for z3 and z4, we'll end up with this equation for the partial derivative of the loss with respect to w1. The same logic can be applied to all of the weights. That gives us this general formula. But let's continue looking at the partial derivative of the loss with respect to w1. We can further try to simplify that equation. Looking at the terms where we take the partial derivative with respect to w1, we notice that we can solve them using the equations from earlier. A quick recap if you don't remember how to do partial derivation. Basically, since we are taking the partial derivative with respect to w1, we'll look at w1 as the only variable and consider everything else as constants. Therefore, the solutions are as follows. We can now replace the partial derivative terms with the respective solutions. Let's do the exact same thing for the partial derivative of the loss with respect to w2. Since we take the partial derivative with respect to w2, we'll look at w2 as the variable and everything else as constants. That gives us the following solution for the partial derivative with respect to w2. If we do the exact same thing for all the weights, we'll end up with these nine equations. By looking at these equations, we see some repeating terms. Let's identify them. First, we'll start with the partial derivatives with respect to disease. By looking at the forward propagation, we notice that these terms turn out to be the partial derivatives of the loss with respect to the terms in layer 1. Next, we can look at the a's in front of the partial derivatives with respect to z1. By mapping them out to the input layer, we notice that these terms look strikingly similar to the a values from the first step of the convolution. Let's copy these values from the input layer and multiply them with the partial derivative of the loss with respect to z1. These are the first terms in our equations. Let's move on to the a's in front of the partial derivatives with respect to z2. Mapping these values to the input layers give us the a values from the second step of the convolution. We'll copy these values and multiply them with the partial derivative of the loss with respect to z2. These are the second terms in our equations. Doing the same thing for the a's in front of the partial derivatives with respect to z3 maps out like this in the input layer. Essentially, the third step of the convolution. We'll copy these values and multiply them with the partial derivative of the loss with respect to z3. These are the third terms in our equations. Finally, let's do the exact same thing for the a's in front of the partial derivatives with respect to z4. This maps out to be the fourth and final step in the convolution. We'll copy these values and multiply them with the partial derivative of the loss with respect to z4. These are the four terms in our equations. Multiplying and adding the matrices together gives us the matrix containing the partial derivative of the loss with respect to the weights. Now, multiplying this matrix with the learning rate alpha and subtracting it from the kernel gives us the updated weights, exactly as the formula we looked at earlier. Beautiful, isn't it?